During the course of these sessions, I'm probably going to say this over and over and over again, and you may get tired of it, but I'm going to be continually telling you to trust yourself and take chances, take risks. Don't be safe. The most surprising poems that I read or the most surprising poems that I write, or at least that I think are surprising, are poems that in which I take chances. I take a risk, not only with my imagination and with my ideas, but especially with words. Artists of all kinds have been describing what they're perceiving and experiencing via the senses for centuries. But what makes it a poem and a new poem now is to do that in a new way. So if I write a poem about something one of you has experienced, and if I do it in a really surprising way, then you can enjoy the poem and you can say, well, that's happened to me. I've felt that before, too. And then we're communicating. Most of you know me, or some of you have worked with me before. Um, if you don't remember my name, my name is Michael Moose. And um, I'm a poet, or one of the things that I do is to write poems and make poems. I'd like to work with you for about three or four days. Would you like to hear some poems by some very young people? There's a poem in here by a girl named Cindy. I think she's about your age. Um, I remember working with her, and she didn't want to write a poem, or she felt like she couldn't write a poem. And I said, well, just write what you feel. Write down your feelings. And she said, well, I don't feel anything. And I said, well, then imagine something. Write down what you imagine. She, she said, well, I don't imagine anything. And I said, well, why don't you try to write a poem about being afraid to write a poem? And then she tried that, and this is what came out. Writing a poem is hard for me. I understand you're supposed to write down what you feel. But what I feel is I am not capable of it. But here in front of me is a poem, my first poem. Now I know I can do anything I want. What do you think of that one? It just kind of is, but it's not. It is, but it's not? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, she said she couldn't write a poem. But she was writing a poem about this. She couldn't write a poem. Exactly. She's not only just talking about poems, but she's talking about a whole way of life. You know, she's saying that if she, if she believes that she can do it, she can. When I go into a classroom, there are a whole number of objectives that I have, and one of them is to revolutionize students' concept of how words can be used, how language can be used. I oftentimes will not only bring in poems that I think will, you know, stimulate an unusual or a surprising use of language, but certain exercises, especially association-type exercises, that will stimulate that. My idea is this, that we put the Earth in the middle of our circle, that we imagine that the Earth has the power to sing. And all you have to do is simply um, write down, listen to each word as I say it, and just write down the first three words you think of. And that we all make up our own versions, make up our own poems about what the earth sings about. Gravity. Stretch your imaginations. Show me how powerful they are. Time, hands, wheel. Have that earth sing about what you want it to. Take the words that you have left over, rearrange them, combine them with any other words that you want to, and make a poem saying anything you want, however you want. The world was like a shadow of its creator. The mountains, the rivers, the forests and streams, its deserts, even its cities. They're all special in their own way. Picture the world in your way, and I'll picture it in mine. Somewhere in my hands, I feel a wind as pure as sunlight, falling from mountains as old as stars. In my mind, there's a beautiful flower. The flower is a pretty shade of purple, but it is not only purple. It is a part of my heart. My heart cannot be copied. The flower cannot be copied. The flower will die. My heart will die. I reach to touch, but cannot grasp. I reach to grasp, but cannot hold. I reach to hold, but cannot help. They reach to help, but I cannot feel. I cannot feel, but I still live. Do I live or just exist? The earth is spaceship in the sky. The earth sings songs no one can hear with their ears, but can hear with their hearts. The earth songs are songs of thanks to God for giving it the glory of taking care of God's creatures and people. The earth is happy being.
a spaceship in the sky. They usually give you a little paragraph, uh, what kind of material they're interested in, who they're published, and things like that. And I just, I use that a lot. And uh, I just started off by, uh, uh, you know, putting a few poems in an envelope and uh, sending it off. And I would, be, I would continue to write, even if I couldn't publish. I'd, I'd continue to do it for myself and my friends and so on, just because I love to do it. Will you read this poem for me? Would I read it? Will you read it for me? Out loud? Sure. Okay. House, be my best friend. Fill my inner needs. Comfort me in sadness. Comfort me in my pain. I feel so bright being with you, House. I see you falling gently over. I see your old trees crying in vain. But House, have strength. Carry on your readiness. House, you shelter men. You seek your walls thoroughly. And know yourself well. In all time when you were born, could you be as free as you are now and still be my best friend? Come and be my best friend. Oh, that's beautiful. Would you read it for me? I wouldn't like to leave my house because I've lived there all my life. It wouldn't be the same if I went to a completely new house. My house is my friend. I can depend on my house. It gives me shelter, warmth, and makes our family be, be closer together. When you know friends, it's hard to leave them. You have a special feeling towards your house. It's hard to say goodbye to your house. Sad sorrows go to your mind. At night, you can't hear the sounds you have been hearing. It's hard sorrows to leave your house. Going away is like waking up in the middle of a dream. There's really n no one certain way that you can plan on what to do in a classroom. Um, I've done it enough years now so that I have a backlog of ideas and things and techniques that can be employed. But so much of it really depends on the instant I walk into the room. Everything has to be spontaneous. You have to play the whole thing by ear. I'll spend about half a session just talking and reading. I try to encourage as much interaction with the students as possible. I try to create an informal atmosphere in which the students can just talk. Have your ideas about poetry in general or about the process of writing poems changed any? I like the way they can express themselves real well in a poem and just talking out. I felt kind of relaxed after you read a few of the poems and it helped let some of my feelings go. Well, most poems I thought they had to rhyme, you know, and I found out that they can be as long as you want them or. Today it's all cloudy. It seems like you'd write not, not a quieter poem because like yesterday, you know, you was happy and bright and all this. And when we wrote that poem yesterday about the deer, we it was kind of helped us with, with the light and all that. Because when you're inside, you have to look kind of outside to get the feeling of being there. I've always heard rhyming poems, but I never heard of poems that was really came in good feelings that were long, had long lines in it and talked about different sad stuff and happy things and it didn't have to rhyme. Do you think that a poem can tell a story? Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. Coal train blasting out of the badlands, too long to be seen with the eyes, like a fever lifted from the broken body of an old woman, gathering momentum now, a diamond head uncoiling from sleep in the scoria, a necklace of coffins bearing the sign of the goat, a dark river of screaming wheels and sparks invading Chicago like a visible vibration. Death barges burning the earth with her own black bones. Champagne and new furniture materialize like an unholy miracle in the living rooms and patios of ripped off ranchers. Generations of immigrants stripped of their land Stock ponds rise into the air and never return. Geese seek a new flyway. America, the rose is dying. Smoke on the horizon. The fire ant finally arrives. The lean thumbs of Woodstock refugees appear like ghosts on the freeway. A few tools have been gathered. A few dreams have been lost. It is time to begin. Yes? Sometimes it kind of makes you drowsy, you know, because you're, when you, you kind of feel, well, sleepy because, you know, you're hearing that 
and you get pictures in your mind, and then, you know, mm -hmm. it's real sleepy. One of the things that I found happening when I wrote that poem was, and I didn't try to do it, I didn't set out with this idea, but the, the, the words just started doing this almost on their own, but the, the words sound a little bit, especially at the beginning of the poem, sound a little bit like the movement of the train, because the train starts, starts off very slowly, and, you know, it's, it's charging up and gathering energy and momentum, and by the time it's leaving town, it's just blasting out with all kinds of, you know, fury in its wheels. Poems can give you sort of like a picture better than a story, a creative writing story or something, because it leaves a little bit more detail. And like you're hearing a poem, you can picture it real good. Also in poems, you can kind of end them at the times you want to. But in stories, when you have to write stories, you have to have a finishing on them. But poems, they kind of leave you just there thinking about it. Do you ever get lost in there somewhere? Sometimes if you use big words. As often as I can, and I try to take students outside the public school environment, even though it's important to work within the context of the school, the outside environments can have a tremendous effect on what students will write. A piece of sculpture like this could provide some ideas for making poems. Well, just seeing this, what would make you come to your mind of writing poems? Just seeing this, what? The first thing, I, the first thing this thing makes me think of is a huge eye. And I don't know why, I think probably because it's, you know, concave like that on both sides, but it's it's really huge, like it could be a moon or a sun. I don't know why, but this makes me, this makes me, when I came here, voices. Yeah, it drowns, it drowns out the voices when you try to talk through. This made you think of voices? Okay. Let's write that down. Let me see your pencil a minute. Voices. Let me see your paper here. Frozen voices gleaming. Frozen voices gleaming into your eye. Makes you happy, just as the sun rises. That's really interesting, you know, because someone could write that poem, or someone could read that poem, who has never seen this before, and they wouldn't have to know that you, that this had sparked the poem in you. Painting the rowboat white. I am on the island, and the strawberries are like ripe hearts. I am kneeling, painting the rowboat white. I speak only to myself now. I pick and eat and drink the fruit parts. It is the oldest story. The mountains seem to bleed in the last light, shattering their distance with their silence. I walk through the summer as though through a fiction. My hunger a blessing, a curse. The sound flows in me when I am far away. In Oregon, the sea cliffs give me life. At Goat Rock, I feel the ocean floor tremble. My hands reach for leaves fallen in storms, filled with thunder. My hands reach for fish flashing through cool water. My hands reach for sadness, or happiness, or pick an emotion. My hands are my hands are to to right. right. My hands are for time. for signing. My hands are for for reading. Papers. High shelf. My my hands on the floor. And I do headstands. Math. My hands mm. are for writing with. My hands reach for flowers. My hands reach for happy. My hands reach for toys. My hands are to eat. Seeds, my hands are to reach clouds, my hands are to walk. Oh, that's beautiful, Mike. That's beautiful. In a sense, it really is a miracle when a child actually, for a moment, feels a kind of power 
whether it be in their mind or their imagination or their heart or their spirit or however you want to say that, when they feel that, um, it, that really is a kind of a miracle. In almost every single school that I go into, I will bend down to a desk and there will be some words that will really change my life. Where those words came from, what the child was thinking about, there's no way that I can ever know. But there are continual instances where I will read poems by students that are not just good for student writing, they're just simply good. That's good. Would you like to read it? You can. I can? <laughs> you sure you don't want to? You know, a lot of people, I think, are shy at first to want to read their poems out loud and share them with people, but I really think that poems should be out loud. Get them out loud. Um, if you feel shy about reading, even if you don't want to read your poem to another person, um, go outside and read it to a tree, you know? Or just, you know, read it, read it to yourself. Uh, read it to your cat. Read it to your goldfish. Get them out loud. I learned an awful lot about writing poems after I started reading them out loud. Give it a try. Okay. Get it in your own voice. Loneliness is the only one there. Loneliness is an empty room. Lonely, loneliness is by myself. Loneliness is in my room. Loneliness is, loneliness is. That's an incredible idea, leading time. <laughs> well, I guess everybody does. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I thought. Usually people have the, the idea that, you know, time holds them and controls their lives. Did you guys hear that? I am a teacher in the classroom, but I'm also trying to convince the students that poetry is more than just fun. It can be fun, but it's work. But it's a very special kind of work. There should be a reverence for the power that words have. It is in everyone's head. What is my life to time? Or all my life is is time. That's really good. I like that. What made you think of that one? Just writing down. You know what I really like about this one is that you go back and forth from describing other things, insects, and then to just your own ideas about it. Would you read it for me? I'm trying. Okay, give it a try. Loneliness. Loneliness is like an ant in a room full of ladybugs. He may not be alone physically, but he's alone mentally because he's different. Difference does make a difference. Let's just take a few minutes and just write down as many things as you want to that you experience out here in this environment or in your imagination that you'd like to praise. While we're writing, um, in addition, I'm there to encourage them to like themselves like what they feel, like what they think, and realize that words or language is just one of the possible ways that they can express their feelings and their attitudes and thus make their life more complete. When I was about four or five years old, my father took me fishing, and I was standing up on the bank of the river and just watching him. He put his fishing rod down on the bank of the river, carried me out into the middle of the river, and set me down on top of this huge black rock. For some reason or another, that memory stuck out in my mind. I think when I was maybe 21 or 22 years old, I was still living with my parents and going to school. And uh, one Sunday morning, I woke up, and my father had left a note for me. And basically what that note was saying was that he was going fishing. He had gotten up at dawn. He went to the same river that he had taken me to years ago and he just said in the note that that he was going to the river and between the lines hidden behind those words he was more or less saying to me I'd like to take you along but I just need to be alone I just need to be with myself for a while the note was written so well and in such a surprising way that I saved it and eventually it sparked in me a longer poem about the memory about growing up with my my family, and a lot about how I got into the process of writing. When I read the poem, later on I talk about singing, and I don't mean singing as in choir, I mean poetry. Singing in the poem is poetry. Let me share the epigram with you. 
Um, this is the note that my father left for me. Michael, I need the comfort of the rock dam, the smell of early morning wood smoke, the press of cool water on the boot, and perhaps a fin or two. No matter, Buffalo River, be back at noon. Buffalo River fisherman for my father. Snow geese headed for parts unknown fly south from Manitoba tundra through the ghost water of Agassiz wind laying their dreaming faces on the night. Each cry, silver and eternal like the echo of a nomadic child swallowing the circular darkness of the grasslands. With the memory of yielding water, I see my father who worships the earth with the faith of stone. In my sheltered eyes, the transparent fishing line floats as tender as caterpillar silk, appearing then vanishing like the cord that joins me with my birth. It was here I first watched the hawk circling when my father placed me on a black rock in the Buffalo River. On this rock, shining like the eye of a morning dove, sleeps my brother who was never born, my brother who crawled back into the night. On this rock, the black pearl of my loneliness grew. On this rock, my search for the scorpion's dancing song began. Slowly the singing began, like a buckskin mare licking the blood from the face of her colt, like the sound of this river flowing within my spine, like the sun entering itself in the sea. Let our tongues slip from the seizure of despair and praise to live without the wound, to die without the scar. On this rock, I long to hold the glowing rib of the moon in my arms. On this rock, my face has grown into the hover of hawk wings. Like my life, a fish leaping from the river, I froze the splash of the fish in my eyes. I have been saving it as a gift for you, my father. What do you think? Thank you very much for working with me and listening. Have a good day.